Welcome back to Bargaining in War. This lecture is on neutrality. In the crisis bargaining literature, there's a conventional wisdom that the probability of war does not change as a function of the distribution of power. Hence, the probability of war is neutral in the distribution of power, and that's why we call this result neutrality. What I want to describe to you in this lecture is why this conventional wisdom really isn't well-founded. There's not much theoretical support for it. But before we get there, let's rewind a little bit and talk about why this conventional wisdom exists in the first place. And I think there's two different reasons. First goes all the way back to our standard crisis bargaining model with complete information, no shifting power, no commitment problems, nothing like that, where we have a zero one interval and we have the probability of victory. We're all familiar with this by now. We have a cost for war for player B, a cost for war for player A, and we know that anything that falls between P minus CA and P plus CB is within the bargaining range, which is the set of agreements that both sides prefer to war. You'll recall that in this model with complete information and no shifting power, no commitment problems to worry about, the probability of war was always just zero. It did not change as a function of anything. So there's the first reason why this neutrality result exists out there as a conventional wisdom. You will note, however, that even if the probability of war does not change as a function of the distribution of power, the deal to get done to avoid war does change. You can see this by just noting that this bargaining range here, if we increase P, that forces the entire bargaining range to move to the right. This is advantageous for A. The deal that A needs to receive to accept and avoid war has to be better and more advantageous for A, and therefore worse for B. Likewise, if we were to make B more powerful, well, that would shift the entire bargaining range to the left. That's the same thing as saying that A is a little bit weaker than it was before. And so now the deal has to be worse for A and better for B. The entire bargaining range shifts. So there are important things that happen when we change the balance of power, but at least in this case, with complete information and no commitment problems to worry about, it doesn't change the probability of war. We also saw that in the crisis bargaining model with incomplete information and A having uncertainty over B's cost for war, that the probability of war did not change as a function of the distribution of power, at least in the way we wrote down that particular model. What do I mean by that? Well, remember that the probability of war in that model is a function of Q, which is A's prior belief that B has high costs. And we saw that there was a critical cut point on Q, which was equal to CA plus CB over CA plus CB prime, where if Q was sufficiently high, namely greater than that quantity there, that a would be under the impression that B is very likely the high cost type and make a risky demand that only the high cost type would accept and the low cost type would reject. Meanwhile, if A's belief was much lower than that, that B had high costs, A would take the safe route, make a demand that is tailored to getting the low cost type to accept and avoid the possibility of war altogether. The key thing to note here is that this cut point is not a function of the probability of victory. You'll recall that we derived that cut point by comparing the value for making the risky offer to the value to making the safe offer for A. So if A makes the safe amount as its proposal, then it guarantees a payoff of P plus CB, and it prefers the risky amount if instead Q, the probability that B is the high cost type times A's payoff for making that risky demand of P plus CB prime, plus 1 minus Q, the probability of B being the low cost type, times A's war payoff, P minus CA. This is how we derive this cut point. If we solve for this, we get Q as being greater than CA plus CB over CA plus CB prime. The key thing, again, though, we're talking about the distribution of power and how that changes the probability of war. All of these P's cancel out in this. So as a consequence of that, our cut point is no longer a function of P. And that's the second reason why people out there think that the probability of war is not a function of P. Okay, so I've given you the conventional wisdom on why people think that this is the case. Now let's talk about why, in fact, this doesn't hold up.
Well, we've seen a couple of different iterations of this. One already, if we go back to our model of stalling, you'll recall that war occurs in that model of stalling if CA plus CB is less than the quantity delta A raised to the T minus delta B raised to the T times P minus Q. So war would occur in that model if this is true. And you can see that in the model of stalling, that probability of victory is an important determinant of whether we get war or not. So already we have a counterexample where definitely it is the case that the probability of victory matters in terms of whether we get war or not. So that's the obvious reason why the neutrality result doesn't always work. But even in this model that we were looking at before, where we have uncertainty over B's cost, the neutrality result only works under the assumption that the players have risk-neutral preferences. What is that? What does that mean? Well, throughout this entire series, we have been focusing on the case where the utility for an accepted offer is just equal to the quantity of the accepted offer. In other words, it's linear. So if we think about this as A's utility, let's just draw that really quickly, as a function of X. So this is A's utility as a function of X for an accepted demand X. It just increases by a fixed amount equal to the amount that is being received by A. There's no complicated interaction or transformation of the utility. This makes calculating things a lot easier, which is why in the vast majority of the crisis bargaining literature, we're often focusing on risk-neutral preferences. It makes the math a lot cleaner. But it's not that well substantively motivated. It's very easy to think that states might have risk-averse preferences, where they care a lot more about getting at least a little bit and care a little bit less and a little bit less and a little bit less about each unit more. So what that looks like as a utility function is that you get a nice boost right at the start that then tapers off toward the end. So this is risk neutral. And this would be risk averse. So one way to motivate why a state might be risk averse is that if you fight a war and you lose, that might mean the end of your state. That might mean the end of your leadership if you're thinking about this as a leader deciding whether to fight a war or not. And so making sure that you're getting at least something out of a deal guarantees your personal safety and a continuation of the state. And that's more important than getting the next unit and the next unit and the next unit and the next unit of the good. There's also another case that you might think of, which is risk-seeking or risk-loving, risk-acceptant, where you don't care at all about the initial amount and you really, really care a lot about getting a lot. Well, this is something more akin to the preferences of a compulsive gambler. It's something that could happen. It's just not something that we focus too much on the crisis bargaining literature. Okay, the reason I'm bringing this up is because if we allow states to have any sort of preference that is not risk neutral, this very special case where a utility for an accepted demand is simply equal to the proportion of the demand, then the neutrality result falls apart. So imagine that the utility for A is not X if it accepts in a demand. Instead, let's let that offer be equal to X to the alpha. So if you accept a demand X, if X is the quantity of the good that you're receiving, then we take that quantity that you are enjoying and to actually get how much utility, how much benefit you get out of it, we raise it to the exponent alpha, where alpha is greater than zero. So what does that mean? Well, think about what this function looks like right here, this risk averse function. If alpha is between 0 and 1, then that is giving you essentially a function that looks a lot like a square root, which increases more at the beginning and starts tapering off later on. So this is actually corresponding to risk-averse preferences. If you have alpha greater than 1, then we're up here with risk-loving. And when alpha is exactly equal to 1, well, if you think about what that looks like, 
if you're raising x to the one power, that's just equal to x, and that takes us to our original case. So what happens if we allow a to have that sort of utility? And meanwhile, we can do the same thing for b. We could have b's utility for an accepted demand be uh, 1 minus x raised to the coefficient beta, where beta, again, is some value between 0 or greater than 0 and has all of these properties before, where if it's between 0 and 1, then we have risk averse. If it's exactly equal to 1, then it's risk neutral. And then if it's greater than 1, then you really love risk. Well, if we take the same sort of decisions as we had been analyzing before, where B is accepting or rejecting, it's comparing its war payoff to its utility for receiving a certain amount guaranteed. I've actually done this math for you before, so we could save some time. If you're interested in the finer details, this is inside of chapter five of the textbook. If you do that, then you get war with probability one minus Q. You're gonna get the low cost type to reject. If A's prior belief, Q, is greater than, and this is a giant mess, so bear with me for a moment, 1 minus 1 minus P minus CB to the 1 over beta, all to the alpha minus quantity P minus CA over 1 minus 1 minus P minus CB prime raised to the 1 over beta raised to the alpha minus P minus CA. So now you can clearly see that this is a function of the probability of victory. That neutrality result completely went away. And the reason is that, again, we calculated this particular cut point using this inequality here. And when we have this inequality, all of the P's nicely cancel out. But once we start getting values raised to exponents, those p's don't very simply cancel, and we're instead left with this giant mess here. So the takeaway here, the moral of this lecture, is that, in fact, the probability of war depends on the probability of p, what is that probability of victory for a, and it's only in very, very special circumstances, which are not very plausible to believe that it's exactly the case that both parties have risk-neutral preferences. Once we get just a single, tiny, millifraction of a step outside of that very special case, the neutrality result falls apart. So the probability of war depends on the probability of victory. It is a function of the distribution of power. It is not neutral in the distribution of power. So I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.